Hello everyone and a warm welcome in joining us for the President's Design Award 2020 Recipients Forum Part 2, Creating a Better World by Design, the Transformative Power of Design. My name is Audrey Lim, your MC for today. The President's Design Award, or PDA for short, is Singapore's highest accolades for designers and designs across all disciplines. Organized by Design Singapore Council and the Urban Redevelopment Authority, this is the 13th cycle of the award. On 30th June, 11 recipients were presented with their awards during the PDA 2020 award ceremony. In the second of this two-part series, today's recipients forum features five of the President's Design Award 2020 recipients. They will share how their design have sparked economic, cultural, and community transformation. Hear how two of the projects have elevated Singapore on the world stage by reimagining the future of construction and civic spaces, and learn how the power of visual communication was harnessed to drive home the message of the culture of convenience, educate youth on complex topics such as fake news and climate change, and nurture Singapore's design scene. Before we delve into the session proper, I'd like to highlight a couple of house rules just to keep today's session running as smoothly as possible. Please be informed that this webinar will be recorded and that your microphones will be automatically set on mute throughout the session. We will most definitely welcome questions during the Q&A segment, and you may submit these questions through the Zoom Q&A function. Should you encounter any technical issues, please reach out to our technical team through the Zoom chat function. Last but not least, this forum will be accredited to CPD points. For those of you who would like to apply for CPD points, do fill in the details required in the survey form at the end of the forum. Without further ado, let's welcome architect Mark Wee, Executive Director of Design Singapore Council to say a few words. Over to you, Mark. Thanks, Audrey. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, speakers, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I think it's uh, for something. So it's uh, afternoon and evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us virtually for part two of the President Design Award 2020 uh, Recipients Forum. Part one on designing for communities concluded last Wednesday, where six of our recipients actually shared how they have designed for and with the community, and in doing so, created a better world by design. Today's forum, which our remaining five recipients, continues to illustrate the transformative power of design. Uh, whether by reimagining the future of construction and civic spaces, nurturing and preserving our design culture and history, or by making difficult topics like mental wellness, climate change, and sustainability more relatable to encourage positive calls to action. The President's Design Award is a Singapore's highest accolade for designers and designs across all disciplines. And at the heart of the award is its impact and value of design. As we celebrate the 13th cycle of the award this year, more than ever, especially against these unprecedented times, are we reminded of our responsibility as designers and of design's higher purpose in solving societal challenges to create a better world. I'm proud to share that these ethos are actually demonstrated by the two Designer of the Year and nine Design of the Year recipients this year. And all of them are standard bearers for Singapore design and all who have made a difference to the lives of Singaporeans and the global community through excellent design. So through today's forum, I hope that each recipient's sharing will be a unique testimony of how design can be a tool to empower lives and uplift communities. I hope also that it will inspire and remind the designers amongst us how innovative and empathetic solutions are more important than ever in the post-pandemic world as we stand united and strive towards becoming a more caring and inclusive society. I'd like to wish everyone an engaging and fruitful discussion ahead. And um, before I hand the time back to Audrey, I just wanna thank all the speakers for being here, being super awesome. We would usually do this in the auditorium, but um, well, we have to do it this way. And this is the auditorium, and this is the National Design Center behind me. Um, but I'm looking forward and uh, have a wonderful evening. Audrey. Thank you, Mark. It is now my pleasure to introduce the President's Design Award 2020 recipients on our panel today. Designer of the Year recipient, Ms. Kelly Chong Cheng from the Creative Director of the Press Room. 
Design of the Year recipient, Aya, represented by Ms. Tanya Wilson, co-founder and education lead of Aya, and Mr. Steve Lola, co-founder and head of creative at Aya. Design of the Year recipient, the not so convenient store, represented by Ms. Astri Norsalim, creative director of Kinetic Singapore. Design of the Year recipient, Air Mesh Pavilion, represented by Professor Carlos Banyan, director and co-founder of the Air Lab at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Design of the Year recipient, Jewel Changi Airport, represented by Ms. Chara Kutkate, partner and director of Safdi Architects. Let's welcome our first speaker, Ms. Kelly Cheng, to kick off the session. Kelly is a modern day polymath, ambassador and provocateur who has been a tireless proponent of design in Singapore. Over the past two decades, she has created a massive body of work spanning visual communications, exhibition design and publishing. She is a passionate champion of design, a mentor for new talents, and a generous supporter and voice for fellow designers, architects, and artists. Ms. Cheng, over to you. Thank you, Audrey. Hi, everyone. Uh, hope you're having a nice afternoon. Um, I would like to start my presentation today by sharing a quote by Winston Churchill. It says, he said, we shape our environment, thereafter they shape us. So uh, I think beauty is generally underrated um, in Singapore um, because it actually has the power to transform and define a nation. Um, it is a kind of epigenetics that, uh, that can actually be cultivated and it can uh, influence the character of a nation. Uh, take for example, Japan. Um, they have a very strong design culture. And um, if you go to Japan before, Everything is so, uh, they are so particular about everything. Everything is so designed. Even if you go and buy like uh, a bento from uh, an Oba-san, um, it is also very well designed for you. Uh, as opposed to, let's just say in Singapore, you go and buy your mixed vegetable rice, as the name itself suggests, you know, it's uh, very messy. So um, I think we have a long way to go. And uh, hopefully, as designers, we can all play our part and continue to push boundaries to create beauty um, in our society. And that will actually help. In, uh, it's slow, but slowly we can help to transform and also build um, a better nation through beauty. So uh, for me, um, I always... Uh, sorry, let me click this. Okay, so uh, last year during COVID, you know, um, the newspaper reported that art is uh, the most, uh, you know, unimportant uh, profession um, in, in Singapore during the COVID, which is very sad because I think art and design are absolutely essential to us as a people. Um, as we know, you know, as a society progress and evolve, um, the art and design of a nation actually show um, show how your culture and also how evolved you are as a people. So uh, in our works, uh, we are always very supportive of the, of the arts community because together design and art, we can create, you know, a stronger culture for our nation. Um, so we, uh, we have participated in many projects uh, with artists uh, collaboratively and sometimes as a supporting role to bring out the value of art to design. So these are some of the art projects that uh, we have done. Um, another aspect that is uh, very important, I think our role as designers is um, to kind of find a purpose in, um, in the work that we do. Um, by giving back and contributing to the society as and when we have the opportunity. Um, on the left uh, is actually an annual report we created for this non-profit organization uh, called Child's Dreams. It's actually a Swiss uh, non-profit company that provides uh, education and also uh, health facilities to underdeveloped uh, countries to, um, to help them to help the children there. 
So we actually created their annual report for them for free. So as designers, sometimes I feel that we might not be able to directly effect some change, uh, but we can always play a complementary role. So when we are able to give our service to help uh, non-profit organizations to do the good work that they are doing, which is already changing and transforming a society, we are also doing our part in uh, changing and effecting some positive change for the society. So besides uh, Child Dreams, we have also contributed to uh, Action for AIDS, uh, TEDx Singapore, which uh, promotes uh, design uh, and education. And also uh, Social Space is a magazine that actually talks about the unmet needs of the society. Uh, like the poor people, the old people, you know, um, the physically challenged people, so on and so forth. Uh, again, it's a very, very meaningful uh, magazine and uh, we are really happy to be able to play a part to use design to convey all these very important messages uh, to people. A lot of times as graphic designers, um, unlike architecture, you know, architecture, you can, you can really directly effect change through your building because it's, it's designed for people to use. But as graphic designers, uh, many times, you know, you can ask yourself, so, so what is your role, you know? What is your role and what is your purpose uh, in, in the society? And I think a lot of times our role is about conveying messages, you know, communicating certain important, uh, important messages uh, to, to the general public. And this is, a, this is an invaluable, uh, invaluable skill, actually, because sometimes messages are, are very, uh, it's difficult to talk about or, or it's, it's hard to, to, to be said in a few words. But as designers, we are able to succinctly uh, kind of capture that in a visual or in as few words as possible. And this sometimes can be really life-changing. Um, the next point uh, I want to talk about, about uh, is about uh, how design can actually help to promote uh, a nation, right? So in this case, uh, I think design can help to advance the Singapore brand. Singapore is a relatively young nation. So, so a lot of, uh, for, you know, in the 80s, uh, people still think that Singapore is a part of China, right? But now we are doing so much better. So as designers, whatever work that we, we push out to the world, it actually directly uh, conveys to the world and tell people who we are as one people, one nation, and one Singapore, the National Day, right? So, uh, so yeah, so I think it's uh, what we do, uh, the, if we create really nice design, for example, like whether it's architecture, it's a poster, branding, everything, um, it, it allows people to kind of piece together in their mind what kind of a country or nation that we are. So in, um, in quite a few uh, of my self-initiated, in my self-initiated uh, projects, uh, such as Ish Magazine, uh, it was started in 1999. Um, during that time, the uh, internet was in its uh, very early stages and there was uh, no design magazines from Singapore and even uh, Asia. So I um, actually created this uh, design magazine, uh, the first design magazine in Singapore, uh, to tell stories of uh, designs and designers uh, in Singapore and also uh, in Asia. It, uh, it, it resonated with, with so many people in, in not just the region, in fact, in the end globally, um, that the, the magazine became sort of like a tool that brings the, the global design community uh, together. And uh, of course, uh, subsequently, I went on to, uh, to run Singapore Architect uh, magazine for, for eight years. And there again, you know, uh, I, I tried to push out as much good works of architects uh, in Singapore. And uh, that again, kind of resonated with, with quite a lot of people in the world. Uh, we, Pressroom has been a long time partner of uh, TEDx Singapore, which is uh, really very much about um, promoting uh, innovators and thinkers in Singapore. So uh, we, we, we recently just helped them to make a book, which, uh, which uh, basically served that purpose. I think I'm disconnected from my clicker. So uh, let me try again. Okay, that one. 
Okay. And um, some of the other self-initiated projects that uh, I have done is, um, is actually uh, 15 minutes and night and day. Some of you uh, might have been there. 15 minutes is, uh, used to be a restaurant and a gallery uh, that is located in, in La Salle. Um, and night and day is actually a bar and an art gallery in, uh, on Saligi Road. Both spaces are created to kind of foster uh, a design, our design community because I always feel that interaction, uh, physical interaction uh, is so important to build a design community, a community of any sorts. In this case, I'm trying to provide this space for conversations and interaction for our local uh, creative community from artists, performers, designers, etc. So both spaces uh, provide uh, that kind of independent creative space for anyone to come and perform, they're all free. So uh, we have a stage in both uh, establishments and the art gallery in night and day, we, we featured a lot of local artists, giving them the, 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 the space to, to voice their, uh, uh, their, their concepts and their creative works and all that. Um, and the, sometimes it is about a design intent as well. So I think with that kind of design intent, it, it actually did achieve the purpose of, of bringing the, the design community together and triggered uh, many different sort of collaborations and, and uh, design activities uh, from there. So I think physical space sometimes are, um, are really uh, underrated and, and uh, uh, they are important in, in sort of uh, making people come together and do something. Um, a part of my, a big part of my career is uh, really about mentoring and nurturing uh, young designers because I always believe that we need to uh, have an ecosystem, you know, a design, a healthy design ecosystem uh, if we want our design industry to go far, you know. We need young blood, we need, uh, we need the old, older designers to mentor the young people so that they, they can outshine us, you know. So, every generation of designers can be better and better. And that will make not only the, the design community stronger and stronger, it will also make Singapore uh, as a brand, you know, uh, stronger and stronger. Um, the last point that I want to touch on is about the importance of uh, documentation education that, that will lead to evolution. Um, for any uh, society, uh, you need to have a history uh, as, a, as a foundation for a culture to evolve. And history is about documentation. So I think our design uh, community, our design history is very underdocumented. And, and in that sense, a lot of uh, the good things uh, and the stories that our former design, designers have done, uh, uh, you know, uh, left undocumented and I find that a real pity because some of these uh, amazing uh, forefathers of our design community have, have passed on or they become very old and all that and um, it, uh, it, it really pains me to see that these, these people's uh, not just their works even their stories you know are not documented and I, I think documentation is important because this history is not just about good things. History is about good and bad because we, we learn from the bad to become better. So it's not just about telling good stories as well. Um, so I, I really hope that I, I can play a part, you know, in, uh, in helping to document these uh, stories and, and journeys. And education, I think, uh, in order for, for design to be better valued by our clients, to have better clients in the future for our younger generation of designers, we need to educate the public in general of uh, what design means and how it is a, a very specific skill and it, it can be difficult. So people need to respect that and also to uh, uh, hopefully, you know, then to pay us decently, right? So I think uh, having events and uh, having exhibitions and all that to educate the public is also very important. And both this documentation and education will lead to uh, an evolution of our design community. So um, I, I spent a, a lot of my time uh, helping to document uh, a lot of design history in, in Singapore. Uh, sometimes it's pro bono, sometimes it's, uh, sometimes you get a little bit of money, but for the most, uh, times you don't get a lot of money, but I, I like to see that 
um, each of us should play our part in helping to build this uh, design history in Singapore so that we can have a, eventually a culture can, can evolve. So these are some of the projects that, that I've done that is about documentation. Rumah 50 documented 50 years of the architectural uh, Singapore profession. Our modern past is a very meaningful project that uh, I work together with uh, uh, two, uh, three writers, Dinesh, uh, Winghin and Harleen, and also uh, the late Jeremy Sun, an amazing photographer. So as a team, we came together and we documented all the modernist buildings in Singapore, and many of which uh, have already been demolished. So uh, this, this volume of three books is, uh, is really uh, quite an amazing documentation. I hope that some of you have uh, kept a copy. Um, on the right is, um, uh, I think, the only full-time architectural academic uh, in Singapore, Mr. William Lim. He has done many books and uh, uh, documenting theories and thoughts about our urban city. Uh, Singapore is an urban city and architecture in Singapore. Uh, these are all very, very important uh, uh, thoughts and theories. So uh, we have also helped him to document a lot of this. Um, Currently, I'm, I'm working on this project, which will be launched in, uh, uh, with the at National Design Center, uh, supported by DSG, of course. This website called uh, USML. So uh, I'm starting to do my part to document uh, the journeys and stories of as many designers uh, as possible. So if I come to you, please, uh, please do your part and allow us to document you because uh, as we started, we realized that it's not easy as we think because there are some people who say, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want, you know, it's uh, going to take up two hours of my time, don't want, don't want. Uh, so we really hope that uh, all of you, the design community, community can give us your support. And if we come to you, please give us two hours of your time. So look out for uh, studiosml.net. It is meant to be an archival website that documents the history of uh, Singapore designers. They are mostly their journeys. These are like mini biographies uh, that I think in time to come, 20 years down the road, this, this will be an invaluable archive for anyone to tap into. It's free and it can even become educational materials for, for schools and all that who by then hopefully should all be learning about design. Um, this is uh, um, an exhibition I did at uh, National Design Center in uh, uh, quite recently, 2019. So uh, I documented 20 years of my work and uh, it really served as an educational platform to also educate people about uh, designs and uh, the, the, the thoughts behind design. So we, we managed to, to succeed quite a good outreach. Um, I think for a design show, we, we achieved 26, 27,000 almost uh, visitorship uh, and our social media outreach. Oh, okay, I'm overrunning. Okay, so anyway, uh, so we, we managed to, to have a really good outreach. Um, and also uh, in terms of, in, in case, in, instead of making a book, we actually made a website. So, it's uh, telechain.com. You can take a look. This is also our way of uh, building towards a more sustainable uh, Singapore because I think too many books, uh, too, too much paper and all that. So we should, we should digitize, digitalize uh, our stories and narratives. So you can, you can read up more on telechain.com about the exhibition. At this point, I, I have to end because I'm already eating into the time of other speakers. So thank you very much. Uh, over to you, uh, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kelly, for your insightful sharing. Next up, we have Ms. Tanya Wilson, co-founder and education lead of AYA, and Mr. Steve Lawler, co-founder and head of creative at AYA. AYA is an educational platform that uses visual communications to nurture children's creative and problem-solving skills. The designers have used design in a humorous yet sophisticated way, captivating and educating children to understand more about the world they live in and to be part of the change they want to see. Ms. Wilson and Mr. Lola, over to you. Thanks, Audrey. Hello. Um, so hi, everyone. So we're going to talk you through um, a bit about AYA. So that's exactly how we pronounce it. It's uh, the Singaporean colloquialism. And that element of surprise is really at the heart of what we do. Um, AYA is a not-for-profit that we founded a few years ago. And it really um, combines our expertise of working in visual communications with our passion for education and nurturing the next generation to be creative problem solvers. 
So as, as I'm sure you're all aware, the World Economic Forum cites critical thinking, creative thinking, and complex problem solving as key skills for the future of work. And these are not necessarily skills that are being developed so much in primary and secondary schools. So this is something that we want to empower educators with materials that they can, they can help to nurture these, these creative muscles in students. Um, so that eventually students become very clear on what they can do that a computer can't. Do you mind going to the next slide for me? It's not uh, going to the next slide. Hi, sorry, tech crew. Can you just help me to, to is it crashed? Is it crashed? Well, maybe while there's a break, I'll show you. This is the physical format of Aya, which is a, a publication we create um, mainly with illustrators to kind of uh, think about modern topics. This is obviously um, quite potent illustration. Uh, and we work with artists from around the world um, talking about things like uh, technology, uh, food, wellness. Anyway, Tanya, here you go. It looks like we're up there. There we are. There's me. There's, there's Steve's son there. Um, so we work with, with artists and designers from around the world to create thought-provoking visuals that are used as a trigger for discussion on complex topics such as internet safety, fake news, sustainability, um, mental wellness and we we provide these toolkits for educators uh, to use them in the classroom and we've had some really good feedback um, about some of the some of the impact that um, showing these visuals have so in some lessons on internet safety students at the end have come up to teachers and said oh i think i've got a problem with internet addiction so we see that real um, transformational power of of creativity um, we get them to practice their creativity. Once we've got their attention with these visuals, we get them to practice it, for example, caption contests. So this, uh, where there's no right or wrong answer, and you start practicing this, this creative muscle, and maybe the students who might not be great at maths and English and science may really shine in these kind of exercises. And it's creative writing, which again is something they don't necessarily practice so much. Um, observation, we get them to find hidden surprises. This is an emoji land and this uh, links to a discussion about um, emojis and non-verbal communication. Who's the founder of the emoji? What are the most popular emojis? We use these, these visuals that make you look twice and uh, use this um, look, see, describe, analyze and interpret methodology. Uh, where the need to understand the image is, is kind of intrinsic to human nature and it invites curiosity and awareness. We, uh, we have interactive um, elements where they might colour in this very detailed internet themed worksheet, giving them, allowing them to spend time with an idea and building confidence and enthusiasm. This is our fake news issue in a, in a primary school and we've asked the students to combine any three images and create their own fake news headlines and then do a fake news quiz on Kahoot. And um, this develops their creative abilities and, and again is a way to discuss fake news in a fun way and capture their attention. Finally, self-assessment is really important in, in everything that we do, where they, they have to reflect on their use of, of devices, how much time they spend online and what they're doing online. And this, um, this develops self-awareness. Um, so transformational creativity, um, we do this on two levels, by making difficult uh, subject matter approachable and interesting, and by constantly exposing children to creativity and getting them to practice their creative muscles. And our hope is that the next generation will become smart problem solvers. Here's some, some visuals of, um, of our work in schools. We got a school to do a dangers of the internet collage. 
and uh, you can see some of the results here really quite impressive and uh, we've made also interactive versions of our of our internet issue so that's um, a school practicing that on the ipad um, uh, as uh, earlier Kelly talked about exhibitions and pop-ups, that's key to what we do. We do uh, often do exhibitions. We've just finished one at the Singapore Maritime Gallery. We do uh, partnerships with f and outlets to have like healthy eating initiatives. That's a sushi, sushi making workshop. We have our school kits, YouTube, merchandise, uh, and very active on social media. So, the, uh, sort of one of our mottos is keep your mind sharp and your eyes open. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Tanya Wilson and Mr. Steve Lawler. Our next speaker is Ms. Astri Nursalem, Creative Director of Kinetic Singapore, bringing you the not so convenience store. The not so convenience store is anything but a typical convenience store. Instead, it is a tongue in cheek reprimand that our culture of convenience is killing the earth. The project is a strong vehicle for the message of sustainability, which comes across efficiently without being preachy. Ms. Nora Salim, over to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Audrey, for the introduction. So the non so convenience store come about when our client, Emma Sex Shop House, brief us to make an exhibition about waste and sustainability. So these are some of the challenges that we face at the start. So there are too many people, too many brands talking about sustainability and we feel that the public are already becoming tired to hear about the same messages over and over again. So then the challenges for us is how do we make it different and create an impactful one? We could blame it on the waste, the disposable packaging and the plastic bags itself, but we thought, why don't we go to the roots of the problem? So surprise people, it's back to us. Uh, it's our culture of convenience why we take away our food in disposable containers instead of bringing our own because it's more convenient. Why don't we bring our tote bag and instead we take another plastic bag because it's more convenient. So we decided to take the very iconic symbol of convenience and turn it on its head. So welcome to the Not So Convenience Store. This is probably the first convenience store to promote inconvenience. So before I continue with my presentation, I'd like to show you guys this video that summarizes our project. Convenience. It's a big part of modern life. Unfortunately, so are its effects. Two billion tons of waste every year. Mountains of plastic, which take 1,000 years to break down. More plastic than fish in the seas by 2050. How can we get people to move away from this culture of convenience? Introducing the Not-So-Convenience Store probably the first convenience store to promote inconvenience. Reusable straws you have to wash instead of throw, travel tumblers that add weight to your bag, capsules that take longer to prep and clean, compost kits that require you to live with wormy waste for months, menstrual cups that need to be emptied and cleaned. Inconvenient zero-waste alternatives like these line the shelves of the store. The drinks fridge is full of bottles and cups that can be reused while the freezer is repurposed as a recycling bin. Every product comes with a tag that spells out the price of convenience, as paid by the earth. This is reinforced by other displays. At the cashier, notes on how to live more sustainably are put in the till to inspire change. Branding materials continue in the same vein, with playful twists on customer service mottos. We enlisted sustainability champions and influencers as employees of the month, serving as examples for others. We also created Instagram stickers to help spread the message on social media. Turns out, people love being inconvenienced. The not-so-convenience store was featured on the news and multiple sites online. It also evolved into a mini-movement, which saw people pledging their support. Okay, yeah, so from outside, it looks exactly like your everyday convenience store, but everything about it is set to surprise the visitors. The name, the color, the design, we have staff uh, manning the store that looks like a convenience store staff, and also we create a special jingle to create visitors. You might hear it at the end of the video just now. So this is how it looks like from the inside. You can see how everything is displayed 
uh, to look exactly like a convenience store. Uh, here we have the products uh, that is your alternative to reduce your waste. Uh, we have like around 60 to 70 products. So we have like compost kit, reusable straws, uh, menstrual cup, reusable containers. Then we have a fridge. So instead of uh, displaying drinks, we display reusable bottles and uh, cups. Freezer instead of ice cream, we repurpose it as an e-waste recycling bin and we teach people on uh, how to how to manage their e-waste. And instead of regular price tag, we put price of convenience versus price of the not so convenient. Is to share with people uh, the bite-sized facts on waste and sustainability. On the shop display, we have messages to reinforce accessibility, such as must not buy, because you may already have some of the items at home. And messages like buy one, get 1,000 uses for free to en uh, en enhance about the reusable messaging. On the cashier, we put notes on how to create change. And then this is uh, some of our posters for the store walls, where we put a twist on the customer service uh, messaging, like this one here. Sorry for the inconvenience. No, we are not, because it's for the earth. Uh, here we have customers come first, just not here because Earth comes first here. And then we have employees of the Man Wall to share what the local sustainability players have been doing to set examples for the visitors. We also have a tote bag donation corner in the store. And this is so far what we have done. We have done three stores and we like that the store can take on many forms in different places, just like the user convenience store and we think the possibility are endless. We also extend it to a social page by creating a special Instagram page for the not so convenient store. And by doing this way, we can share sustainability messages, little bite-sized facts about how to save the earth. Uh, we also extend it to Instagram stickers, which are very, play, very fun to play with. Uh, we also have racks that feature local businesses that have been practicing sustainable choices and with this way, we hope that visitors can come here and also get inspired, uh, see there are uh, little ways that they can adapt to their own businesses. So the store forms an equal local community with these brands that support us. And we like it that by coming to the store, they can see all these many products in one, in one space instead of going to many different places. And with no media budget, we are very grateful with the attention given from the local and international media. It also gathers positive sentiments from the public and creates uh, a positive chapters. First, so to summarize, it shows that with design, we can transform a commonly used topic into something fresh and surprises people again. And it, allows, and it allows us to present solutions in small, easy steps to help solve a big problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Astri Norsalim. Our next speaker is Prof. Carlos Bagnon, Director and Co-Founder of the Air Lab at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Today, he will share about Air Mesh Pavilion. As one of the world's first fully functional 3D printed space frame structures, the pavilion is an emphatic proof of concept that puts Singapore firmly at the forefront of global additive manufacturing of complex structures and is a model for a more sustainable future. Welcome, Prof. Benyon. Thanks, Audrey. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, attending. Uh, well, um, in these five minutes, I'm going to use them to talk about like the power of technology and design, and particularly uh, related to 3D printing, which is what I mainly do at the Air Lab. So it, but not just tree printing, just uh, for the sake of using technology, because we want to implement technologies with a positive impact in sustainability. So industry creates more than 20 million tons of construction waste every year. So it's sometimes underestimated, but it's definitely something we need to do if we want to improve the way that we build and we design. And additive manufacturing, which is basically 3D printing, contributes to lower the levels of energy in the production up to 21%. So actually um, could be um, a technology that can change the game um, in, the, in, the, in the near future. But why we 3D print in architecture, right? That's a question that I'm also trying to answer, right? So there are a few reasons that I started my research in 2015. Um, first, because mainly it is zero wastage in fabrication, right? It's additive manufacturing, so you don't remove much, you know, when you fabricate, which is great. 
Second is because it can create really radical new aesthetics due to the full freedom that we have when we place materials. And third is that allows for pre-formed design in architecture. So we targeted the existing systems that are standardized angles and geometric discontinuity, and we wanted to actually create a pre-formed continuous uh, system looking at the way that we can build in the future. So we combine our 3D printed node system with standard components so we don't disrupt the industry uh, dramatically. Basically, we try to combine existing products with our 3D printed node. So we, um, we design our scripts that create all the components uh, they were all generated with um, uh, digital design. So we can print directly uh, from the file to the 3D printer. And all components can actually be assembled into a very complex way, in a way that we can design these redundant structures. And this one, for instance, was the one that we did um, in SCPD in 2015 with a radical reduction of material and also um, creating a gathering space for the open house in 2015. That was the first version of the system. Then we, we, we want to explore, because we are printing uh, with uh, lots of space inside, can we use the space to run services? And we start exploring using uh, LED light inside and running services inside the, the structure. So 3D printing allows to create more efficient and even um, a complete new aesthetics when we, when we design. So this was an art installation that we did for the ILAC Marina Bay Festival in 2017, when we used translucent nodes and, and, and bars to create this kind of cloud-shaped pavilion that was actually open to people to interact. So it was changing color as you touch, as you get close to the bars. And it um, was, was quite an uh, experience for us to, to push the system forward. That was also repurposed into a chandelier in the National Design Center after the exhibition was over. But also we're looking at renewable materials like bamboo, which is fast growing and powerful carbon sink. So, we use technology and design to deal with bamboo in a completely different manner. So we cut the bamboo poles, we scan in 2D with a super simple scanner, and then we send the information to our script to print the components that can actually extend the shape of the bamboo in a seamless way. So we created canopies that can be assembled in less than a day by a team of five. And this is the aesthetics. You can create any shape. And this was in Daxton Hill for three months, we stand in really well and serve a stage for eventual concert. Four, can we reduce the use of material while maximizing the structural performance? Then I looked at stainless steel as a material to print and to experiment with. We went to the extreme of working with six mm uh, uh, profiles, so extremely thin, like a pencil, right? So actually um, printing the components in stainless steel, uh, we can create the connection between those bars and achieving an outstanding uh, ratio between the load that it can take, about 200 kg, standing only in three small supports. This is the connection system and the air table in 2018. It was a seat for the air mesh pavilion. So can we design an entire space producing zero wastage in its construction? That was the question that we formulated when we started the Air Mesh Pavilion. So we scaled the size of the nodes to this kind in which we also uh, designed the threads to connect standard bolts to the bars. Those bolts are concealed inside the profile so you cannot see the connection. And the connection is as fast as five seconds with a hex key. It's like putting together your IKEA furniture at home at a larger scale. And the good thing is that this is a high performance structure, stainless steel, super safe, uh, code compliant, approved by BCA. So almost disappears in the landscape because it's extremely slender and thin. And then we cover it with a repurposed fishing net to create a breathable skin and a space closer to nature, framing the views towards the uh, highlights of the gardens by the bay. So we achieved maximum structure performance with minimal material and zero waste in construction. And for us, this is just the beginning. We are exploring the system in vertical farming and other vertical structures as well. So soon we will we'll be sharing news about the Aramish 2.0 version. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks for that presentation, Prof. Carlos Benyon. Last but not least, our final PDA 2020 recipient, Ms. Charo Kukate, 
partner and director of Safti Architects, who will share on Jewel Changi Airport. Jewel Changi Airport redefines the notion of an aviation transit hub by creating a public centric facility accessible to transit passengers. Not only does it represent a new typology combining retail spaces, passenger conveniences, and a garden within a climate controlled glass enclosure, it is also a powerful civic landmark that places Singapore firmly on the world traveler's map. Ms. Kakate, over to you. We might need you to unmute for us really quickly. Thank you. Thank there you, Audrey. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Safety Architects, I'm really proud to present Jun Changi Airport that was awarded to our project, to our form for an international design competition. I'm unable to, to change my slides. Um, okay. This, this is, it, the project is located in the center of the Chang, at the center of Changi Airport and sandwiched between Terminal 1 and the control tower. Um, as you can see, it was a very, very tight site, which used to be an open air car park with a train running through it, connecting Terminal 2 and Terminal 3. Even though Changi Airport had a big program, which they gave us during the competition, which consisted of shopping and uh, retail area as well as aviation. Um, it was very challenging to design that for a tight site. But if, even in, in spite of that, we tr we strongly believe that in, in addition to fulfilling the brief, our design should include a timeless attraction, a community garden centered around a tall waterfall. Our design proposal consisted of 135,000 square meters of space spread over 10 floors that connected to all three terminals. Contrary to the traditional retail design practice, which always where the shopping is in the center, uh, the focus of our building is centered around a 15,000 square meter public garden, which is free of any commercial activity and is accessible for 24 hours. This garden extends from level one to the top level, level five, and as you can see, uh, sorry, the slides are really moving slow. Uh, as you can see, it, it has it extends from level one to level five, where we've created multiple attractions for families to enjoy. The waterfall centered in the garden creates an amazing serene space in the heart of the airport. The garden is neither a decorative display nor a, uh, nor a simple botanical exhibit within the building but a landscape of grandeur and wonder. Working with amazing engineers at Bureau Happel helped us rationalize the form of the building. The waterfall created a lot of new challenges. The toroid shape of the building could not be symmetrical to avoid the water falling on the train. Bureau Happel helped us create delicate tiger shell structure to cover the garden and the spaces below. We also worked with Atelier 10, our environmental engineers, who helped us with the designing of, of designing the comfort of human beings and garden. Because both humans and plants have different needs, we use different strategies for selecting, like by selecting the glazing panels, by using radiant uh, floor cooling to create a comfortable environment. The engineers also helped us to map the natural daylight so our landscape architects could select trees based on the actual light that could come into the building. For example, at the highest level, which is very close to a roof structure, uh, we selected trees with shade, you know, canopy trees. Whereas as you go down, we, should, we selected trees that were tall and light could filter down. We created full-size mock-ups to test uh, to test and resolve some of our construction issues in advance of the main construction. The mock-ups helped, the mock -ups helped, uh, helped us understand the landscape elements, paving design, the facade structure, and even the behavior of the water, how it would fall from the stall height of 30 meters. 
But the biggest challenge was not so much about these mock-ups, but more of the site. The site was so tight. It was a logistical nightmare for the contractor. They were tasked to work with very limited access to the site for the trucks and equipment. They had firm deadlines for completion because it impacted the neighboring terminals. This aerial picture shows you how tight the site is between the control tower and terminal one. And because of the tightness of the site, construction workers, different teams had to work together all under tremendous pressure working together to complete the jobs in hand. And sorry, the slides are taking time. Uh, this is a technical marvel in, in terms of technology and in terms of the way the structure is constructed. From digital engineering to automated fabrication, from precision manufacturing to onset assembly, this structure represents radical advancement in emerging technologies. In Jewel, the garden is built entirely, entirely on the structure. The picture on the right shows you the the completed structure. Uh, and it took a lot of huge collaboration actually between engineers and architects and landscape architects and environmental engineers, structural engineers, all of them working towards a common goal, a goal of creating something wonderful. And this is the result that we created. This is the result of the collaboration effort. Because after all, a great building is about relationship at the end. The building is very well connected. The building is very well connected to all the terminals, making it convenient for the locals and travelers to access. It is also a first place where many visitors come in and this is their, and appreciate Singapore. This is the new gateway to Singapore. It is also a new building paradigm where a range of facilities from aviation to shopping and retail and entertainment coexist they coexist under one roof. In a comfortably air-conditioned space, Jewel introduces people to wonders of nature and plant lives. It, it houses approximately 2,500 trees and more than 100,000 shrubs from all over the world. Bringing natural light through the 14 meter high acrylic funnel extends the wonder up to the basement areas, which otherwise tend to be dull. It has become a precedent where nature and city are one, where a traveler can feel rejuvenated and a, and a local residents are enthralled by, this, by what the place has to offer in the form of entertainment for families and for families and kids all around. Jewel is a building that belongs to everyone, locals and travelers, to senior citizens on wheelchair, who sit and in, in peace and enjoy nature at a comfortable environment. Walking in the forest valley with the forest around you, sun pouring from the sky, rain in the form of waterfall falling from the sky is like experiencing a natural wonder and not an interior garden. The same space transforms into a magical wonderland in the evening. Jewel Changi Airport returns wonder to air travel. It lifts our beings and creates a new paradigm of how we think about a journey and the public spaces are related to it. It does this by merging architecture, urbanism, public space, landscape, greenery, and retail in a new way. It's a complex hybrid layering of spaces and experiences which brings people together from all around the world. It is truly a place where Singapore meets the world and world meets Singapore. New York Times wrote an article about vacationing at Ch Singapore's Changi Airport. It's unheard of, vacationing at an airport which is such a stressful place. I must say that after being involved in the project right from conception to the end, this is a testament of teamwork and a team's vision of designing and constructing a place that can sustain life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kakate, and thank you to all our recipients for sharing on your inspiring and impactful projects. I'll now hand the time back over to our moderator, architect Mark Wee, once again for the Q&A session. Welcome once again, Mark and the recipients.
Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for sharing. I, I know we've um, taken a little bit more time. So what I want to do is maybe ask each of you all a question and then perhaps, you know, uh, you all can answer that and then we can give some time to the floor to also answer some of the questions. So I think to everyone who's listening in, if you could still please type in your questions, that'd be great. And I'll just kick off with some first. Um, Kelly, yeah. um, so I'm trying to ask you some personal questions, but well, it's good. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, has there been a specific moment or example that really spoke to you about or impacted you by design's transformative power? I mean, I would just want to hear what, what yeah, share, share, share a story about that. <laughs> if yeah, you could. Sure. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, share a, a personal uh, story. So uh, when I was 18 years old, I designed this album cover called The Teenage Head. It is, uh, it is by an indie band called uh, Odd Fellas. This was done in 1990, 1990, when the indie music scene in Singapore is still uh, not, not really happening, you know. Uh, so this, this became the, the best-selling indie album at that time at 5,000 copies, <laughs> which is unheard of. Uh, so this album cover is, uh, I think, it's transformative. In, in many, on many levels, what, one is for myself as an 18 years old. Uh, I, was, I was so happy, you know, uh, because I couldn't believe that uh, album cover that I designed um, could, you know, sell so well. And the second thing is that at that point of time, up to 1990, you know, as I mentioned, the indie music scene in Singapore is still... Uh, not really happening. Uh, but this album kind of opened the doors to many more uh, indie bands to, to be launched and to, to you know, uh, make their own, cut their own album because they all have to self-finance and all that and not many, uh, not many indie bands dare to do it because they, most of them sell 500 copies, which you cannot even uh, cover the cost of a recording and cutting the album and all that. So this, um, this album to me is so meaningful because it opened the door for uh, indie music in Singapore. And uh, funnily, you know, just uh, about a month ago, this uh, uh, company, production company just got in touch with me. Um, they are making a documentary on the Singapore music scene. And they said that this is one of the most iconic album cover ever made in Singapore. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean, it's a little story and, uh, and, and I really, uh, I mean, I think it's a good story. And actually, if you read carefully the album cover, Pat Patrick Chung, the lead singer, he wrote, he autographed the cover. He said that, thank you, Kelly, for designing this cover for free while I make lots of money. <laughs> hey, thanks for sharing that. I think what's more scary is actually... I know about the odd fellows, right? So that just gives me a date as to how young I am. Uh, I just reveal your age. <laughs> to, the, to the Aya team, A, I love the name Aya. Um, B, I mean, you mentioned we all were just sharing earlier about how it was really set up where to teach, teach people or teach kids about things that computers can't do. And also with just the idea of just more and more user generated content uh, just uh, coming out online and people wanting and aspiring to be uh, YouTube influencers and, and, and internet influencers. Can you share a story of impact that your project has made? Um, I mean, sorry, I guess what I wanted to know, which were the topics that resonated best with the kids and to what extent their designs actually helped to create the impact and response? I'm super curious uh, and it's super refreshing to hear what you're doing. Uh, okay, well, I mean, you know, some kids prefer different themes. Obviously, the internet's a hot topic because they all love the internet and YouTube. And, uh, you know, like you said, the, the influences are, are sort of like um, a big feature in their lives. Um, so there was several images uh, in, the image, in the internet issue, which are, you know, they provoked ideas like uh, being in a iPhone prison, for example, um, you know, trying to discuss perhaps this idea of uh, isolation through through the phone. Wow. And sorry, I should just hold it a bit longer. Um, you know, and I think wow. this this idea didn't really occur to them, but when you quiz them on it, they realize that when they are um, when they're on the phone, they're not 
interacting with their environment, but they actually also felt by the same token they were interacting with a, a different set of people, you know, their virtual friends or, or, or things like that. Um, I, it's very hard to see, but this is a, a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a landscape and what there is, there's cookies hiding in the, in the landscape. And um, we use this as a device. So they had to find all the cookies and then it, it, it sort of prompts the discussion, what is a cookie, you know? Um, well, it's something that's spying on you. It's something that's listening to you. And of course they didn't know about this. So now um, they're aware of cookies, uh, good and bad ones. Um, and I think one of the, uh, one of the sort of post, um, workshop sort of uh, feedback or results that we did. We did a survey of, of uh, some of the information. And what was really interesting was uh, after the workshop, I think it was 80% of the kids removed friends from their friends list who they didn't know in real life. And um, they didn't know that if they post a photograph online, it's online forever. They can't take it back down. So these are real uh, basic things that they need to know and they didn't know and, and actually just by having that discussion in, in a sort of warm environment um, really really had uh, an impact very visible immediate impact so I think uh, yeah that's that's probably a good case study. Wow Tanya you want to add anything to that? Um, you have kids how would they how, how would they take to your uh, yeah <laughs> oh, they, I mean, they love it. They're always looking at, at my computer and seeing what we're doing. I think they, because my work sometimes feels like play, and I think it does to them as well. Uh, so the image behind me, the, that, that's one of the images we had for our trash issue. And it's a scene of chaos in the Arctic, and they've got to find the penguins. And teachers are saying to us, you know, sustainability and climate change can be a bit uh, doom and gloom but we do it in a very fun and colorful way and and um, that's uh, a different way of approaching it which which the educators appreciate and the kids they they love that kind of where's wally colorful illustration and they love finding things in it i think they're naturally observant and curious and this brings out those traits and celebrates them wow yeah, I, I think you all might be able to find out all the future creative art directors in Singapore at, at, by the ages of like 10. Uh, so maybe, uh, thanks for sharing about that. Um, I don't know, I mean, to, to Astri, I, I just want to, I've been to the Not Convenience Store. We had one at the National Design Center. Um, uh, it really touched me, but I, I wanted to understand, I saw a lot of young people going through it. Can you share us, perhaps a story of impact that your project has actually made on people? I mean, I know so many have been through it, but any personal stories that you actually were able to encounter about the impact of the store? Yeah, yeah. So I guess the, the interesting thing about our stores is it's full of small actions that people can take. So I see it in different, uh, it's adapted. I see it in a lot of people around me, like especially like my husband, he used to be an ignorant man. He just take another disposable <laughs> cups every other day. But now he brings his own cups, he, he wash his own plastic containers and then we, we reuse it again at home. Uh, then I also see it in the people in the office. So it also, the project itself makes us also reflect on, on our habits. So now in our office, uh, when we go out to tapau the drinks, we bring the cups from our office. And then when we go on shoot, instead of taking another plastic bottles, all of us bring our own uh, drinking bottles outside. Wow. Thanks. You said he was an ignorant man. I mean, that's the word I'm going to remember. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thanks a lot. No, I, I think it's really been kind of amazing the kind of impact it's, it's made. Um, Carlos, I, 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 I didn't manage to, I think I saw the pavilion in, when I was walking by. I didn't know what I could get into it, right? But uh, I mean, to be honest, uh, uh, as an architect, it's, it's, it's just mind-boggling because technically you've kind of created uh, language or technology to build anything. Uh, what other uses can, you know, your, the MESH design and technology be applied to? Any future plans to extend its impact on other social or community areas of need? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy that, uh, I mean, I guess some people are saying, I, I haven't seen your pavilion. I have, I've been in the gardens, I haven't seen it. It, I like it that it's not in a mainstream location. It's kind of hidden somewhere. And even if you're close, it's quite, you know, 
invisible because it almost disappears. So I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> uh, and regarding the system, yeah, I mean, we're working to, to scale the system, right? So uh, as I said before, the Hermes is not just one pavilion, it's a system. So it's a, it's a, it's a proof of concept that it works. And the idea is to, to test it in different conditions, right? It's an adaptable system. Um, we have tested it in different materials. We have used the bamboo one for low cost construction. We are using the stainless steel for more high performance um, construction. So, so we are targeting developing actually now the some disaster relief uh, structures that can be assembled in just a few hours by untrained people. So that's one of the projects we're working on right now. Wow. And uh, the cladding doesn't need to be a mesh. I mean, the cladding could be glass, could be a solid panel, could be something. Uh, adapted to, to our system, so it's, it's, it's quite flexible in that way. And uh, we also got an inquiry to, to design a house, like station of a, of a shop house, so we're going to test the, the, the system in a, in a, in a real-life condition. And, um, but also we are, we're pushing the system also to, to build more adapted um, and efficient shelters for our sports spaces and community centers in Singapore. And, uh, and uh, by end of the year, we're testing it as well in vertical farm uh, buildings. So the idea is to create the, the wow. necessary conditions for the plants to grow uh, optimally and uh, with an added value of aesthetics and, um, and the versatility. So we are expecting to have something to show by end of the year. Wow. Heck, that's a lot. You should make yeah. that. You, that could be an inconvenient house, huh? Right. <laughs> so, we so, work together, yeah. yeah, we should. And, and and it could be a it could be a classroom for, for Aya. Actually to the Aya team, I, I have it at home, you know. And I'm trying oh, to wow. show. There you go. Right. <laughs> um to, to Charu. Uh thank you. I mean I think everyone's been into a jewel. Uh, how can they not? Um as an actor, I know these projects uh, would have taken years of your life. Um but what do you think is the intangible impact Joel has had on Singaporeans or tourists such as people? Uh, and maybe you could speak to that uh, in light of how travel has actually also changed dramatically with the pandemic. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, these things uh, are issues. You care to answer to that? Yeah. Uh, let me start with the intangible thing. You, you know, when you look at a building or something very nice, people go there and people say, wow and they see it once and they see it twice and they see it thrice and that's it. It's like a wow factor and that wow factor, it, it has a short life because something else better comes in. The thing with Jewel is because it, it involves nature and natural light. Uh, and then because of the natural light, the way the whole atmosphere keeps on changing, I think it has created a sense of wonder. What we found it remarkable was when people come in and there's a sense of wonder in their eyes. They look at it, they're like, wow, look at this garden. Where did it come from? You know, these trees. Where does the water come from? Where does the water go? When they go down to the basement to see where the water goes, they're shocked to see that they can't hear the waterfall because of the acrylic mm. cover. And that was something surprising even to us because the acoustical engineer said it would make so much noise. It would be like trucks on a highway. You know, and, and what mm. happened was there was absolutely quiet silence when you go to the basement. And I think this itself, you know, for me, even after working on this project for so many years, um, I'm amazed by the quality of light you get and how the light changes. It's, it's, it's fun to see a rainbow in the morning near the waterfall. It's fun to see how the light changes, filters down, and how you can see uh, the diagram, the shadow of the diagram in the water. It's fun to see how it changes in the evening, and then the and then the projections on the water itself is very interesting. That's what people like. So you know, it's it's, it's that's what keeps on changing. That's that's a very uh, that's something that you don't think so much about design, about, you know, you don't think, you don't think you're going to create a sense of wonder. That's not something you're going to create. It just happens, you know, when everything comes together the right way, it, it just happens. Um, during COVID, it was even more interesting because there were a lot of people who could not go out because it was raining, it was hot, all sorts of things. People were going into Jewel. So before COVID, there were travelers, transition travelers who would stay an extra day in Singapore just to visit Jewel. We met so many of them, they would write to us. We met so many people who said, okay, you know what? I'm traveling from Australia, I'm going to London, but I'm gonna take a day's hop and I'm gonna just stay in Jewel. 
or I'm going to spend a day in jail kind of thing. And now, but because the airport is closed, can you imagine without Jewel, there would be no one going to Changi Airport. But today with Jewel, people are still going to Changi Airport. Yeah. And because of that, the terminals are still open. The FNB is still kind of open for, you know, for people to get, get there. Um, I've seen old folks, you know, people on wheelchairs sitting and enjoying, which, which they find it difficult to do out, outside. And I think, I think that's sort of, uh, when we say that this building is for one and all, we really mean it. It's, it's not just for people who like shopping. It's not just for people who like to eat. It's not just people who like to just, you know, see nature, it's all together. And most importantly, it exists in an airport, which is sort of unheard of, you know, airports are really stressful places to have a garden, a huge garden and shopping in the airport in such a manner, I think um, that has really made a difference. Uh, to oh, thanks. Planning. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's really first impression is like the book, the air conditioned nation. It's like Singapore <laughs> in a bubble. Right. <laughs> I have one. Uh, there's some questions out here. I want to kind of put out one, maybe for kinetic, curious. To, it's a question around curious to know if there were any other concepts considered besides a convenience store. And how do you land on that idea? I'm sure everyone has asked you that before. <laughs> Uh, okay, so when we first have the the brief and then we get to the inside, it's actually, it went pretty straightforward for us when we thought about the inside convenience and then we linked it to the convenience store. So we kind of don't have the discussion about like what other icons to link into convenience store. Yeah, we kind of all agree to that, to that iconic symbol of convenience. I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, guess it's because, a good idea. <laughs> I think it's because like convenience store have a very strong uh, design elements that we all designers kind of can relate to. And also there are a lot of design elements that we can play with. So I guess when the idea comes out, we all just kind of go gone wild with the possibilities on extending the design. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, Okay, well, wow. okay, we've got a couple of minutes and there's a bunch of questions, right? I think you all can read. I'm either thinking of the last, okay, maybe we ended the last one that you all see. There's one around, how can designers stay relevant and contribute meaningfully to solve challenges uh, in society, especially in the, uh, these unprecedented times we're living in? Uh, I think all of y'all have amazing skill sets as you, in your own realms. How, what kind of role do you think y'all can play or designers should play in this crazy world going forward. Maybe this is something for everyone. Who wants to answer first? Okay, I'm just gonna throw it at Carlos. <laughs> Waiting for it. <laughs> I mean, um, I, mean, I, I can see by myself. I mean, um, I think seven years ago, uh, um, I think I was. Um, a completely different designer. Uh, so I think it's definitely um, uh, the times in which, in which we are going to keep ourselves as designers as fluid as possible, as uh, open to learn, open to transform, and, uh, and to find ways uh, to create impact by design and probably also to look at technology as a way to, to magnify or our power as designers, right? So I think um, I found myself like the last seven years, I, I, I evolved a lot. Uh, and I, I and I am practicing in a completely different way than I did before. So I think it's a, it's a it's a special moment in which designer maybe we need to actually be even more open to to transformation. Um, so I think it's a uh, it's keeping ourselves like, really open to update and and to go even deeper in the thing to do. Wow, Charu, women okay. who created a sense of wonder. I think I think that by creating spaces uh, that bring in more of natural environment, spaces that inspire. I think that's an important thing to do. I think having offices that are just totally with artificial light and everything, I think that's, that's really taking a toll on people. People are working long hours and they need to have something that is more nurturing. And, mm. uh, and I think uh, COVID has shown that when people stop going out, nature survived. 
I think it's the same thing with people. I think that we need to bring nature and people together. I think greenery is not just the greenery on the roads and streets and beautiful trees. I think it needs to be incorporated more in natural light and greenery needs to be incorporated more into everyday living. That is more people are spending time in the offices. So I think that needs to happen. And I think it's important to uh, nurture people you know, in, 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 by creating environments that help. So true. Thanks for the answer. Steve and Tanya, I mean, I mean, the crazy world out there. I mean, I'll add things like fake news and things like that. It's just even things that you're battle with in your realm around communication. What's your answer to that question around what kind of role designers can play or your can play? I think like being critical, you know, I mean, uh, in a constructive way. So whether you're a designer or whether a consumer or whatever, if you're kind of constantly questioning how to improve things, how to, uh, how can this be better? Um, they seem to be the obvious uh, response to things like environmental improvement uh, processes, which are wasteful, uh, things like that. So yeah, it's pretty generic advice, but I, it, it's also quite key to designers who are constantly sort of questioning the reason for most things and can they be improved upon? I think that that's part of our DNA and it should be also the way that the, the main public thinks. Wow, great. Tanya? Um, I mean, for us, we, we look at um, some of the needs that we're seeing in education with children. Mental wellness is something that, we, and if that we're focusing on at the moment. How can we empower educators and parents and social workers to talk to young people about their mental well-being? Um, we've heard that, that some, some uh, adults feel um, it's quite stigmatized to talk about that topic. And we believe that visual communication can completely remove that stigma. Uh, and so that's what we're focusing on now. We, we see there's a need for that specifically at the moment. So that's an urgent need. Wow, so good, man. Astri? Yeah, uh, I think for us, as I think we think as a designers that we have to be more in tune in this time, in this pandemic, because a lot of people mm. are having a difficult time. So I think when we are more in tune, we listen and see what are the problems around us. And only by then we can... Uh, know the real insights on what's happening around us and therefore creating a solutions through designs. Yeah, uh, you all are storytellers. And Kelly, how may, uh, may you end with your answer? So, uh, yeah, so I think as uh, communication designers, graphic designers, um, a lot of times uh, it, it is about conveying the right messages. Uh, so, for example, I mean, for us, we created the first vaccination campaign in Singapore in January to get people to go and get jab. So with the poster not nice, nobody wants to get jab, you know? So very important. <laughs> so yeah, so I think uh, uh, as, as graphic designers, uh, as Mark, you just said, we are storytellers. Uh, we, are, we, we need to com communicate um, the right messages and to get people to do the right things a lot of times. So like, for example, sometimes a message is very simple, happy family, you know, you get jab, then everybody stays healthy. Um, so I think that's the power of design uh, to make it as, as simple uh, as possible for, for anyone because this, uh, this campaign is for old people, young people and all that. And, uh, and yeah, that's, um, that's really the power of design. Wow, thanks. For all the questions, I know there's some questions out there that we can't answer, but we'll, we'll reply directly. But thank you. Uh, thank you for all, the, all your speakers. Uh, the future is crazy, but I think, as Steve said, we should continue to be critical and question and also really kind of use our skills to just provide hope. And um, let's do it together. Over to you, Audrey. Thank you so much once again, Mark and recipients, for sharing all your experiences with our audience. To our guests, we'd also appreciate it if you could complete a short survey for this webinar to help us improve on our future programs. Please scan the QR code for the survey form. For those of you who would like to apply for CPD points, please also scan the same QR code you see on the left of the screen and submit your particulars by today. If you would like to find out more about the various upcoming programs the National Design Center has lined up, do also scan the QR code you see on the screen. And if you'd like to find out more about the recipients, please visit our website, pda.designsingapore.org.
And with that, we will be ending the session for today. Thank you once again to all our speakers and to all of you, thanks once again for spending your Thursday afternoon with us. My name is Audrey, have a great evening ahead. Goodbye. <laughs>